scan. And the facial nerve is not actually visible. There's no distinguishing. You can't see it on any imaging at all. Uh, but the, it exits from the stylum mastoid foramen, which is sort of close to the uh, mastoid tip. And usually what the radiologist can do is to give us a trajectory of where it's going to be. But there's no definitive way of saying exactly where the nerve is in relation to the gland. Um, it's surrounded by the parotid capsule, which is uh, a continuation of the investing layer of deep cervical fascia. And when we talk about this in terms of the head and neck, this is also part of the superficial muscular aponeurotic system, the SMAS layer, which you may hear referred to certainly in plastic surgery. It's the same layer when you're doing a facelift. So the plane you get into there is a way you can get, get right down and forward. And then the nerve which comes up through the gland goes to, uh, supplies the muscles of uh, facial expression, expression from underneath, so they're not actually uh, superficial until quite a way out in the gland. Um, Stenson's duct, or the parotid duct, runs parallel and inferior to the zygomatic arch, so it's a fairly good marker you can do externally to see where it is. And it, it runs along and then does a chicane to pierce the buccinator muscle and then come in intraorally. So it comes out adjacent to the upper left second lobe. And it's quite a long tube and a fairly big diameter, which we'll come back to a bit later. And I put down about the parapharyngeal space because the deep lobe of the parotid is also into the uh, parapharyngeal space around here. And again, you can get tumours and masses within there which can create quite technically surgical uh, challenges. The facial nerve, as I say, makes life difficult for us in terms of surgery on the parotid gland. And uh, certainly we tend to sort of skip over the bits and talk about the extra cranial components of it and what happens to it in the gland. But the facial nerve, the seventh cranial nerve, also has some components within the middle ear. Uh, it supplies a couple of muscles. Do you remember what they are? Anything to do with hearing? Pedius. Is that Pedius? Yes, the pedius. And what does this pedius do? Um, it attaches to the stapes. Yeah, which is on the bones. Yeah, it basically works a bit like a dampener. So it basically, when you've got really loud noises, it, it, it sort of contracts and will limit the amount of noise. So often when people have a, a palsy of the nerve, like a Bell's palsy, they have hyperacusis, so they have problems with really loud noise. So it does the Sapedius anything else it does? Um, no. All right, you've done well anyway. Anybody else? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So it gives off two, two uh, muscular branches. Uh, it also does something else. What about a particular special sensation? Affecting the mouth? What is it? Yeah. Okay. So it, so it, it carries the fibres, the taste as well, doesn't it? Okay. And then the extra cranial component, where it comes out through the stylomastoid foramen, um, it has a varying branching pattern. So everyone knows about the five. Um, it doesn't make a great deal of difference because once you found the nerve, it's, it's, it's all a bit varied from there. We seem to have jumped in much. So the submandibular gland, um, this fits in the submandibular triangle, so the borders of that are fairly easy to remember. So you've got your digastric, as we mentioned before, and your lower border of mandible. Uh, and deep surface of this is the mylar hyoid, and this gland tucks around the back of the free edge of the mylar hyoid. So it does have a superficial and a deep component, and people talk about lobes as well, but again, it's all the same gland, so it curves around the back. So this, the deep component is, is not much to it. And again, it has a capsule which is derived from the investing layer of deep cervical fascia. The important structures around the gland are usually, when it's, not, it's actually not that related to it, but in terms of surgery, is a margin mandibular branch of the facial nerve, which in 20% of people crosses over the lower border of the mandible. So it's important that when we're making incisions to get to this, that we are careful of this nerve, make the incision below, and then push up, pull everything up. The disadvantage of doing that is often we cause some traction increases on the nerve. The lingual nerve uh, is in close proximity to the deep surface of the gland, and the ganglion that supplies the gland comes off the, the lingual nerve. And 
the hypoglossal nerve is a bit deeper. So those three things, those three nerves are all really important when we're consenting patients for removal of the gland. And the facial artery and vein tuck around the gland and again have a variable pattern, but often you need to be aware of those and tie off the facial artery and vein. And the submandibular duct is important as well when you're doing the surgery to tie that off as high as possible or as distant as possible close to the opening because you leave a blind ended tube in terms of problems later on this can cause problems with obstructive symptoms. The sublingual glands, sorry excuse my spelling, um, I haven't really got a good picture of these actually but these are located at, these are intraoral structures and sit on the undersurface of the, well the floor of the mouth and the undersurface of the tongue. Uh, so they're between the mandible and the genioglossus. They have no capsule around them and they have a variable drainage. So you can have tiny little microscopic drainage out through directly into the mouth or they can have several drainage that goes into the submandibular duct. Minor salivary glands, just to say there's an awful lot of them and they're everywhere. They're not just around the oral cavity, they extend, as I said, right into the oropharynx and further down as well. Now this is a bit, it's a long, long time since I remember any of this, but you have your acinus, which is your secretory cells. Uh, there is the intercantocalculated duct, which I think modifies the uh, consistency of the saliva, and myoepithelial cells are important in contraction and expressing it, expression of the saliva. That's enough said about that. So we produce a lot of saliva a day, so 1.5 litres, which is, you know, if you think about how much that is in a, in a bottle, that's quite a lot. And it's not a steady flow, so we have a, a, a trickle of saliva, but then when we have food or think about food, we uh, stimulate our glands and produce quite a, uh, a big flow. And at night time, our saliva drops down as well. So it's natural for people to wake up with a slightly dry mouth, which is important if you already uh, have uh, difficulties with dry mouth. And it's the experience you get with drinking alcohol with a hangover. If you're dehydrated, then your saliva flow is reduced. So um, we produce about a milliliter a minute, um, between, between a quarter and another minute. And at resting times, the majority of this is from the submandibular gland, which makes stringy, sticky saliva. When you have it stimulated, when you have a meal, you produce a, more, a copious amount of serous saliva, mainly from your parotid gland. And so the composition of the mucinous part is much bigger in the submandibular gland. So, what's it important for? Um, I know that the dental students will know all about the various things, and I'll just put a, a few of them down, but it's really important to have saliva in your mouth, not just for your physical comfort, but for the well-being of your teeth and mucous membranes. Your mouth is supposed to be wet, it doesn't cope with being dry. Um, it also has some important uh, digestive factors, particularly salivary amylase, which starts the digestive pro process, and also immunological factors. And, terms of antibacterial effects. So we break down to the disorders of it. We can have an overproduction, an underproduction, infections, neoplasm, trauma, and trauma. So basically a surgical symptom. But actually, because of most of this is resting salivary flow comes from the submandibular glands, doing that alone is, is usually pretty effective for, for these kids. Um, underproduction of saliva, or xerostomia, is, a, is a, a, a nasty condition. It's extremely uncomfortable for patients who have this and causes a lot of problems, both in terms of their ability to enjoy food, their taste is reduced, uh, their ability to have any dry foods is greatly reduced, so most of them won't be able to manage a sandwich, have to have frequent sips of water and have really quite soft food. Uh, the mucous membranes become very friable because they're not used to be drying out, so they have problems with aphthous ulceration, trauma, traumatic lesions. They're likely to get super infections in terms of uh, candidal or bacterial infections. Um, they can get ascending infections of their salivary glands and are much more prone to dental caries. 
So it's a pretty horrible condition. In terms of the definition of xerostomia, I think they call it a flow rate of less than a quarter of a mil per hour. And in terms of the causes of this, I suppose the commonest cause of xerostomia is physiological, so age-related. So it's not uncommon as we get older to have reduced salivary function. And for some elderly patients, this can become quite a difficult problem. And the next most common one is drug-induced. I think there are well over a hundred common medications that will cause dry mouth symptoms. Um, some of these are related to the uh, acetylcholine, which is the uh, neurotransmitter. So anticholinergic drugs will have that effect. Or uh, more indirectly, such as diuretics, along with antihypertensive and all sorts of things. Uh, again, diabetes uh, can be a problem. Uh, this is due to uh, autonomic dysfunction within the gland. Uh, mouth breathing is not really xerostomia, but people who mouth breathe sort of have problems with it. The mouth becoming very dry and uncomfortable. And then the, uh, the other ones that we come across are iatrogenic, so radiation-induced xerostomia, which again is a real problem for us when we treat patients with head and neck cancer. Um, and the other common one is autoimmune disease, which in the comments we use is Sjogren's syndrome. So this is a, an autoimmune disease affecting the exocrine glands, so the salivary glands and the lacrimal glands. It's about nine times more common than in females and males, at about three to six per 100,000. So not really that common, really. It's often linked to other autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, SLE. Um, and the diagnosis of it is, is, uh, is not done on one single test. So there are diagnostic criteria uh, which are quite wide ranging, just from symptomatics, uh, essentially the symptoms, to salivary flow rates, to autoantibody screens, um, to pathological changes. And what you see is uh, um, sialectasis, so sialadenitis in, around the um, asinine. And unfortunately, there's not an awful lot we can do about it in terms of curing it, and it really is symptomatic support for these patients. Um, so making sure that they have regular dental treatment, salivary substitutes, and uh, measures to improve their symptoms. It is important that they're, they're kept under review because 5% of them can develop non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, particularly either malt lymphomas, um, which is mucosally active, lymphoid tissue or uh, large diffuse B cell lymphomas. Infections. Bacterial and viral ones. Um, I don't think I know of any fungal infections affecting the glands. The bacterial ones are mainly due to reduced salivary flow. So the flow from the salivary glands should be a one-way process with a constant flow of saliva. Where you get stasis you get problems. And this is where we get ascending infections coming from inside the mouth. So um, it used to be a fairly common thing to see in hospital wards, particularly with elderly surgical patients, that they would develop ascending bacterial infections. And you would hope nowadays with better um, fluid balance for these patients, it doesn't, it, we don't see it. Um, we see quite a lot with the, the sequelae of obstructive gland disease, which Jimmy will talk about in a bit more detail. Um, viral infections are a lot of things that can cause uh, problems with the glands, but a recurring thing which we see every year still is outbreaks of mumps. Uh, and this often affects young adults. We see quite a lot often coming through the university, so it's again happens more when people are in close proximity, so halls of residence and so on. Um, I've never seen somebody who's had the classic symmetrical parotid swelling. It's usually one submandibular or parotid gland, and they're pre feeling pretty lousy and unwell. Um, there's no obvious treatment for it apart from supportive care. It is a notifiable disease, and uh, it is contagious. Um, do you know what other problems mumps can cause in young men? Seriously. Yeah. So it is quite a serious condition. And how does it cause sterility? Do you know what else it affects? What swells up? Orchitis. Orchitis, yes. Which is why he's not looking very happy, I presume. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, just going on to other things, we see quite a lot of cysts um, around from the minor salivary glands, uh, and these are caused usually from, from trauma to, the, to, the, to these minor salivary ducts called mucosils. They have variable appearances, but they're usually sort of uh, translucent swellings and fluctuant. This one, the lower lip there, also has an element of trauma over the top of it, so you can see some keratosis. They're really easy to deal with, you just need to chop them out. We see other ones where we get the similar cysts that develop with the sublingual glands, and these are called a ramula. So these are like a frog's, um, what is that, frog's undercellus. Uh, so they swell up like this and they can get really huge. Um, and if you remember that bit of mylohyoid that has the free edge at the back, sometimes we get a thing called a plunging ramula, where, the, where this can actually start disappearing down into the neck. So these can be pretty huge swellings. And in terms of management of them, the traditional way of doing this was to marsupialize. So basically what you used to do is just to decompress it, cut into the top of it, maybe stitch it open and hope that uh, it would go away. And that does work occasionally, but often they come back. So often what you need to do is to actually remove the whole of the sublingual gland. And occasionally, if it's a plunging ramula, you need to go back and uh, do an extra oral approach and remove the submandibular gland. I haven't got a picture of the removal of a sublingual gland because it's a, um, an awkward little procedure to do in a very confined space. Um, so basically what you need to do is to find the gland, you need to identify the two structures that are running around it, the lingual nerve and the submandibular duct, which are both in close proximity, and then tease out the gland. And unfortunately your access is never like that because you're working in a tiny little hole. So, going on to neoplasms, as a rule of thumb, most of the ones that appear in the parotid gland are benign. So, 80% of parotid neoplasms, of which 80%, sorry, of salivary neoplasms, which are 80% are benign. When you go to the submandibular gland, they're less frequent, but they have a 50 50 chance of being malignant. And in the sublingual gland, um, they are very rare, but they're nearly exclusively malignant. Basically, uh, the commonest ones we see is a, is a thing called the pleomorphic adenoma, uh, which is entirely benign and very slow growing. It does have problems because unless you remove it completely, it can occur. Um, and uh, the, 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 usually these things have grown over years and years. So it usually takes, I very rarely see a, a, a swelling, a, a, a benign neoplasm that's less than a centimetre. That's Usually the other ones are picked up incidentally from other imaging. There's usually about a centimetre when patients notice something. But as you can see with this old guy, we still see these occasionally in these really huge, huge uh, masses. And in terms of imaging, we usually do a multi-modality thing, so ultrasound with cytology, MRI and CT scan sometimes. The key difference with malignant ones these benign ones usually have no pain associated with them and normal facial nerve function. We get very worried when we have patients who present with pain with these, and particularly if they have facial nerve weakness, that's a late sign that something is not right, and this is a malignant <coughs> patient. Here's a picture of a submandibular gland excision. This is relatively straightforward. I do this from a, quite a small incision, which makes life a bit more difficult, but this is a fairly straightforward procedure. We're aiming now towards day case procedures for these ones and it takes about 30 minutes worth of surgery. So the patient should be up and out of hospital and back to, back to normal life fairly quickly. The traditional approach to removing of submandibular lesions, uh, sorry, parotid lesions was, was from a, a, a superficial parotid exome to basically lift up the skin flap to expose the lump uh, through a fairly big incision. We can hide the first part of this one around the, around the ear fairly well, because that blends in fairly nicely, but often they do end up with a scar in the neck. Some people have used the facelift incision, which goes up behind your ear and across into your hairline. Um, I've never really found that quite effective, because I think your access is quite limited. And um, for men, it's not really good unless you want to grow a mullet. So uh, you, end, you can see the scar around the back. So the next stage on this is to find the facial nerve, usually not using your finger like this, but it's usually fairly far down. So we have various markings to find this, but 
people are often quite surprised how deep down the, the, the root of the facial nerve is. So if you think about where your digastric, the posterior belly of the digastric is, it sits about a centimetre deep to that. And once we found the nerve, which is this bit we can see on there, it's a matter of dissecting and lifting things out. So this is a fairly major procedure which the reason for finding the nerve is if you find the nerve, you shouldn't cut through it. In other words, you can work on top of it. But carries with it a high rate of causing transient damage to the facial nerve. So we've developed more minimally invasive techniques, doing an extra capsule dissection. So here's one that's been done just by making a fairly minimal incision just over the lump. And what we've done is I've dissected down to find the parotid fascia. Basically, we do a cruciate incision over the parotid fascia, which we can lift back like so, and then it's a matter of carefully dissecting around the lump, leaving a little bit of uh, normal parotid tissue around there, and that's it with the lump gone, and the lump out. So now we can get these lumps out as a day case procedure. I've yet to have a significant nerve injury that hasn't resolved within a week, um, and it, it really has, I think, revolutionised parotid surgery. Gland obstruction. Um, we often see these patients who present usually what we call mealtime symptoms. So they have something to eat or think about something to eat and develop a fairly rapid swelling of either their submandibular or parotid glands. It usually comes on very quickly. The period of the time the gland, where the swelling resolves can be minutes to hours or days. Um, and it's usually caused by a blockage within the, within the drainage system. If you leave it, you can get problems with ascending infections because, as I say, the saliva should be a one-way passage. And eventually, if you leave it, we have problems with the gland stops functioning properly and then it is a bit of a vicious cycle. And that's where I'm going to finish here. Would you want me to say any more?